And we have lots, we always have lots of good people who have been doing all kinds of gardening for many, many years, lots of expertise. And uh, tonight is no different. And, and Kent, why don't you introduce yourself? And Thanks, Sandy. Uh, my name is Kent Miles. I am a specially cut flower grower in Western Champaign County. And I can answer questions with regards to perennials, cut flowers, annuals, uh, woody ornamentals also. We received a email from Cindy, it looks like, with regards to knockout roses. And her email question is, my knockout rose, roses appear to be completely dead on top, but sprouting from the bottom of the, at the base. Are these roses grown on their own roots? I am not sure if I should dig it up or not. Will the new growth be true to the original color of the blossoms? Thanks, I love your show. Uh, knockout roses are generally hardy to about zone five. Uh, they will die back in the winter time, the canes will. Uh, you will get your new growth, uh, like you are in your uh, email question. Uh, and they do come back to the color that they were, that you planted, whether it be red or pink, uh, white. Um, and generally in the spring, late winter is when you want to go ahead and prune those dead canes out. And you want to go down to um, a green cane, whether that be halfway down on the cane or all the way down to the base. Um, and you just want to give a nice clean cut, uh, use clean shears to do that with. Uh, knockout roses generally get it rounded the three foot to four foot in height and about that amount of spread on the plant. So it's unfortunately, um, you do have to do some pruning on knockout roses. Yeah. So it's, that's really pretty common yes, to, have them, to have them die back. So, yeah. and, and actually, to be honest with you, I think sometimes it's a good thing that knockout roses kind of mm -hmm. die back because sometimes they can, I've seen them get really big, yeah. like almost to that five, if they mm -hmm. haven't really died back mm -hmm. enough, they get really large. Yeah. So that sometimes that's really kind of a, kind of an issue too. Mm -hmm. So so thanks, thanks Ken, sure. for, for that. So that's always a, one of those things you just learn about living mm -hmm. around here, right? Yeah. And Kay. Okay, hi. I'm uh, Kay Carnes, I'm a Champaign County Master Gardener, and I can answer your herb, vegetable, um, and seed saving questions. And I have an email from a viewer, uh, Karen, and she said that they have a garlic bed that they planted last winter. Uh, the bed is, um, and they've mulched it really thickly with straw, but she said the stalks are only about 12 to 18 inches tall and are weak, and they removed the scapes um, but they were shorter than normal. <clears throat> um, the tips of the garlic are, are turning brown, and she said we fertilized them with bone meal a few days ago, but I'm wondering if they are going to make it. Any suggestions? Well, at this point, they probably they are going to make it. Um, 12 to 18 inches is, is kind of short for um, the garlic, uh, but the weak and the weakness um, may be due uh, to the size of, of the clove that you planted. Smaller cloves will yield smaller plants and smaller bulbs, so uh, that may be a factor. Um, the brown tips are not a problem as I see it right now because um, garlic turn the leaves turn brown and kind of die back as, as they're getting ready, you know, as it gets closer to harvesting them. Ideally, you should harvest it when the uh, all but about th two or three or four leaves are uh, brown and the uh, that's usually about the end of June or the beginning of July. It may be earlier this year due to that early heat that we had in, in May, so. But I think that you'll be able to harvest, it's just, um, they may be small. So maybe some fertility, maybe for next year, yes. I don't know if they're planting them in I, the same year, place. I wonder about their planting them in the same that, place. Either that or I would, I would uh, you know, after you pull all the garlic, I would till in or d dig in a really nice layer of compost, um, and that keeps the ground, uh, soil loosened and uh, also gives them yeah. fertilizer. They're kind of heavy feeders, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, okay. they are. Okay, very good, thank you, Kay. And Phil? I'm Phil Nixon, I'm an extension entomologist of the University of Illinois, and uh, that means I answer bug questions. And so <laughs> the, uh, the bug of the month of, uh, of May and June is the emerald ash borer. They don't get quite this big, they <laughs> top out at about a half an inch long. 
Thankfully. Uh, and uh, they come out of, of holes that are about an eighth of an inch wide, flat on one side, round on the other, D-shaped. And they're all flying around right now and laying their eggs. Those eggs will hatch into larvae, which when they get full grown, they look about like this. And they're about an inch and a quarter long. And they feed underneath the underneath the bark in the cambium area, we call it. And it will actually girdle your tree with enough of them there. And so if you decide to try to protect them, which we normally figure is going to take about 20 years of, of every other year or, or yearly treatments, uh, this is the time to be doing that. Ideally, you wait until the leaves on the ash tree are at least three quarter expanded so we avoid any impact on bees and other pollinators feeding on the pollen. And we recommend using nematocloprid or dinotefiron. These are going to be systemic insecticides easily available at your local uh, garden center. Or you can hire a arborist to come in and every other year apply emamectin benzoate and they will know what that means. Uh, but just say you're trying to get rid of an emerald ash borer and they'll start running off names to you and everything will be hunky-dory. But realize that it's a long haul to, uh, we got to kind of uh, keep the bugs down until the ashes that are not treated have all died, which is happening pretty quick under most, in most of the viewing area. Yeah, I'm, re I'm really amazed as, as you're traveling around, you can see these, these trees that are just almost completely dead, but then they have these like suckers, these mm -hmm. branches and stuff at the bottom, and you can almost identify it just from that as it's probably an ash. Yeah, it makes um, it easy to identify ash by. trees. They're the dead or dying trees. The right dead or dying thing, trees, yeah. unfortunately, so unfortunately. So it's mainly ash, so it'd be like green ash, white ash, Blue ash, if mm -hmm. they have it around. So blue ash is very uh, resistant. Oh, re so, okay. Yeah, so blue ash might be one. And white ash is somewhat resistant. Green ash okay. is the worst, along with black ash, which is more of a swamp tree. Okay. Okay. Very good. Yeah. And I'm so glad they're not that size. That would be yeah. kind of scary <laughs> in a number of ways. Uh, and I want to let people know about, uh, actually, what I think is a great book. I know a lot of people are into apps and all those things these days, but I actually like a real book, like a real hard book. Uh, and this is Vegetable Gardening in the Midwest. This is actually a uh, an updated version. This is like the third version of this particular book. Uh, and it is from the University of Illinois Extension. And really, the nice thing about this is it's been updated for varieties. Uh, it, so to me, this is just one of those, if you're into vegetable gardening, like garlic or whatever you're, you're, you're growing, I think it's really a great book to have. You can see what kinds of things are going on in the Midwest when it comes to vegetable gardening, because we know it's different here compared to you know California and other states. So you can get this through the U of I extension. You can actually go online, just uh, check the website for publications. I think it's like $28.95. So it's under $30. You can, you can get a great book for your library when it comes to vegetable gardening and you know maybe maybe share it with your neighbors and friends and stuff so that's a really good book. Uh, I also want to let people know uh, remember about that we do have the podcasts so the Mid-American Gardener has a podcast Victoria uh, does a great job of putting those together and she has a number of different guests I've done one and a whole bunch of people have done done them uh, Kent this week is actually Kent Miles our very own Kent Miles who's yeah. here tonight so uh, Kent why don't you tell us what you talked about on the podcast or kind of give us a little tease about what you talked about. Well, well, we talked about uh, peonies, we talked about hydrangeas, uh, wedding flowers, it's, okay. that, it's that season. Okay. Uh, a few other little goodies. Okay, very good. Yeah. I, and I actually, I love having the podcast simply because it is something that you can go out to the garden, you can, you know, take it with you and just mm -hmm. listen while you're out there if you want to just, or as you're driving or whatever, you can check out the podcast and it's really a great way to, great way to find out more information about specific things and questions that maybe you've had in the past. And remember, you can also go to our website for Mid American Gardener and you can see past shows. So, you know, if you're, you're dying to know, you know, I think they talked about hydrangeas three shows ago or whatever, you can check that out as well. So it's really a great thing, a great resource, I think, for everybody. So check that out when it comes to more information. And uh, I think we're going to go ahead and go around to our uh, second. I think you have some more questions. Yes. We're going to go ahead and mm -hmm. go through those. Okay. Uh, we've got an uh, email that came in from Barbara. And it came in, um, oh, probably about mid-spring. Mid and it's about a, her gardenia plant. Uh, she recently purchased a gardenia plant uh, for her indoor enjoyment, indoor use, uh, is where she's uh, having the plant. It was uh, surviving uh, pretty good until today, which is a few months ago, uh, when the leaves started to turn yellow. And that's her photo that she submitted uh, that has the inner, inner leaves are yellow. They're usually going to be the lower ones. 
And uh, so she went ahead and transplanted it to a larger pot. And uh, she wants to know um, how to get it back to being a little more healthier. So generally gardenias um, require a lot of water and humidity. Uh, I would suggest if you don't already to take your uh, pot that you have it in and perhaps put it on a tray of pea gravel or gravel and keeping water uh, at a level at the top of the rock. So it sits on top of the rocks and that's going to help commit, create a little more humidity around the plant. Also, if you have a mist bottle, misting the, the plant uh, will help also. Um, for gardenias, to get them to continue to bloom, you need cooler temperatures. So they're really tough to do that uh, during the summertime uh, for here in Illinois. Uh, generally, 60 to 65 temps is what they need to set the buds and maintain the, the blooms to open. You want to use an all-purpose uh, blooming plant fertilizer to increase the blooms. And it generally prefers the morning sun. So uh, morning sun yeah. would be the location for that. I, I, mean, I give Barbara a lot of credit for having mm -hmm. a gardenia because I think out of all the oh. plants, they're really, really little finicky when it yeah. comes to temperature. So fragrant, wonderful plants, mm -hmm. but they're not the easiest one in the world to grow. So hang yeah. in there, yeah. Barbara, yeah. Uh, and just realize, you know, they need very specific requirements when it comes to, you know, watering and all those kind of things. So good luck on that. So thank you. Thanks, mm -hmm. Ken. Yeah. And on, uh, we're going to go ahead and go to our callers on in line three. We have Carol from Jacksonville, and you have a looks like you have a question about wisteria. What can we do for you, Carol? Yes, and I want to know what zone I'm in. What zone you're in in, in Jacksonville? Yes. You're in the middle of zone five. Five. <laughs> <laughs> zone five. Uh -huh. Zone five. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a wisteria that's growing on a fence, and it's really thick and lush. Do I need to thin that out to get more blooms? So is it blooming at all? Yeah, it blooms in the spring, but then it stops. Well, that's kind of... And I get these little seed pods. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're just wanting to make it more lush? Is that the idea? No, it's already very thick and lush. Yeah. Do so I need to thin it out to get more blooms? Will deadheading because help the on that? blooms come early spring and then they're gone. I think that's then it. I get these little mm -hmm. seed pods. I, think it just I mean, do they ever real? I don't. Is there too much greenery? Do I need to thin it out so more sunlight gets in it? Some wisteria will bloom later in the season, yeah. but I think it has to do with a variety of them yeah. to a great extent. And I think what the panelists are saying is, is that one of some are just spring bloomers, and you may have one of those. Yeah, oh, I. Who? That's not what I wanted. Oh. I wanted one that bloomed all summer and spring. Mm. Yeah, I don't think you're going to, I don't know that you're going to see I that. I think they bloom generally, once it re on, once it re redolent, will just, they'll bloom in the spring and then they might come back with a smaller bloom later yeah. in the summer, yeah, I think. Usually but, they're, they're the big. but they're kind of a one shot and done sort mm -hmm. of plant, usually, I think. Yeah, they're, but they are good to, tr you know, to answer your question, they are good to trim back and stuff because they really can, wisteria can really take off and eat your house if you let them. So <laughs> hopefully it gives you some ideas. And on line four, we have Kay from Decatur. And uh, one of my favorite plants, banana trees. What can we do for you, Kay? I am so glad to hear you say one of your favorites. Um, <laughs> I have one of several banana trees this year, which I overwinter inside in a nicely, not over hot room. But my banana tree this year has got five babies what do i do oh coming out from the base well they're right there on top i have heard that when they produce babies up there at the top one big and the others are just starting that the plant will die yeah, I'm not sure what you mean by it. Because usually they, they'll suck her up from the base. Right. And you'll get new plants from there. And generally, perhaps the mother plant would die back, like a bromelade. Okay. So yeah, you... Yeah, usually the mother plant doesn't doesn't die back until she actually produces fruit. We're talking mm -hmm. about her right. as though she was right. a... <laughs> anyway, so until she produces fruit, till the banana produces fruit, and then it'll die back and the new ones come up. So maybe that's what you're kind of thinking of. 
But no, you just have new babies, it sounds like, coming up from the base. Yeah, right as a whole tree. Will it die? I have heard horror stories about, yes, it will. And others say, no, it won't. I wouldn't think so. No, if you're getting it through yeah. the winter, I say, good for you. Yeah, <laughs> that's bonus. <laughs> yeah, that's a bonus because you can, yeah, you can actually get those through the winter with proper mulching. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there's some of them, some of the bananas you can actually get through, not all of them. But, oh, that's great. Good for you. So, no, don't, leave, don't believe them. You've got, <laughs> you've got a great thing going, so enjoy it. <laughs> and on line five, we have Phyllis from Watsika. And it sounds like you have a barberry bush question, Phyllis. Uh, yes, I do. Um, with the drought and everything, I've got a couple uh, barberry bushes that got a lot of dead in them and everything, mm -hmm. and they've got quite a bit of life, too. But what I want to know is, can I cut those down to the ground, and when could I do that? Okay, cutting barberry bushes down. Well, personal experience, um, <laughs> I have had some branches die back, and I was a big fan of barberry when I... Uh, move to my location where I'm at and uh, over the years I've changed my opinion on barbarians. <laughs> uh, so so I have actually tried to remove them and I have cut them back to the ground almost and they do send up a flush yeah. of bright purple eggplant colored foliage and stems and um, yeah they will might be a little late, you know, yeah. I don't know, you know, here we are in, in June, might June. be a little yeah. late, but they, you know, so if we get in a droughty period, you might want to water right. them, but yeah. I'd still, they're pretty, really pretty tough plants. Mm -hmm. They are. All in all, so, okay, so go for it. Get out your shears and go for it. And on line three, we have Tom from Urbana and lightning bugs, one of my other favorite things. What can yeah. we do for no, you, Tom? I'd like to know from the entomologist, <laughs> what has happened to all the lightning bugs? When I was a kid, they, you, we used to catch them. Last night I saw one. I'm really upset. Can you tell me what's happening to the lightning bugs? I don't blame you, Tom, because one of the beauties of living in the Midwest is you get lightning bugs. So what do you think, Phil? Drive out into the country. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, essentially, uh, we've, uh, we've uh, kind of messed up the, our spaces and cities and, and towns to where we don't have very many of them. The, uh, the larvae and, and to a lesser extent some of the females uh, we'll, uh, we'll live in, in moist bark mulch and so on, and, uh, but, they, but they, need, they do best in, in shrubby areas and things of this nature, and, and bluntly uh, in our cities, we got rid of all that. So you get rid of the, you get rid of the uh, habitat, you lose the fireflies or lightning bugs, but uh, now we've had fewer this year because of the, of the extreme drought that uh, mm -hmm. we've had, at least where I live, south mm -hmm. of Champaign. It got so very dry, and I haven't seen a whole lot. But generally, at this time of year, you can look out the door around uh, 9 o'clock, and there's 20 or 30 at a glance. I mean, it's just all over the place. But in town, yeah, they don't, don't have it. And, uh, yeah, you messed up a habitat, so what do you expect? You know, How about insecticide pressure? Not really. Not much. Uh, uh, the, uh, because the... Uh, the larvae are down in the soil where they're not really being impacted too much of them. They're in non-crop areas. They're, they're away from that. And, uh, and, and really, uh, people that, that landscape on a, you know, many of them are, are, are a do-it-yourself sort of thing, and they're not putting on many insecticides. So I think it's more of a habitat thing. Insecticides could have an impact on it. But, uh, but, but it's, you know, out in, out in the country uh, where there's a lot of uh, waterways and so on and so forth and moist areas and, and mulch and so on, they're doing great. So right, good, well, thank you very much for answering it. Uh -huh. good, good news, Tom. You just may have to take a little drive out <laughs> to the country, but they're, at least they're still around. So that's great. Thanks for calling. That's a good question. We always like to see. I love lightning bugs. It's one of my other favorite things. And on line four, we have Eileen from Urbana. And you have a question about moths. And I really wonder if it's going to be the question I think it's going to be. So Eileen, you have a question about moths? Good. I hope it is. Uh, and I'd like to have Phil tell, tell me why moths yesterday swarmed all around the front of my house, snuck in the windows, snuck in the door, both in the front and the back. And I wondered if you know what's going on. We're having a, a fairly large emergence of armyworm moths right now. And armyworms are, are larvae that will feed primarily on small grains. They feed on wheat, uh, rye, oats, those sorts of crops. 
uh, and uh, to a certain extent on corn, but primarily on those small grains such as wheat is the main thing. And certain years, and they're primarily kept in, in, in check by naturally occurring parasitic flies that attack them and take care of them. And every once in a while, every few years, for the first generation, the army worms will have three generations a year, typically for the Midwest and much of the Midwest. Uh, t sometimes the, the parasitic flies don't show up for the first generation, they show up for the second. And so these moths would, would have a wingspan of about an inch and a half, and they're going to be kind of a, of a light orange color with a single spot in, in the front wing. And, uh, and they are attracted to the lights at night, and I could spend the rest of the, of the hour telling you how, why moths come to lights at night, but it's all based on keeping, keeping the moon at the right, right edge to them, and, 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 the, and the electric light is too close, and they just spiral into it. Uh, but, uh, but at any rate, that's, uh, that's what's happening. They're yeah. probably army worm moths. And then later, most years, we get uh, uh, green clover worm moths, which are real, real dark brown. They show up in about a month and a half. And I wonder about what, if you have little leaf lindens, because I, my little leaf linden tree is blooming right now, which is very fragrant, I love it. It is covered in these moths, these army worm moths. It's and just, moths are important pollinators. And, and they're, because it's, they're going to the nectar and stuff that's in, yep, the, sure. that's in those flowers. So I wonder if she doesn't have a little leaf linden nearby, it's why she's noting. So the moths are just kind of annoying and, yeah. you know, it's really caterpillars. But for those of you that are interested in pollinators, they are the, they are a night pollinator, and, and they are pollinating many of the yeah. whitish bloomed yeah. plants that will almost glow at night to attract moths. That's why they would do that. Okay, very good. Good question. I was hoping somebody to ask that question because I <laughs> had some other people asking me about that. Anyway, and on line five, we have uh, Judy who has a question about cactus. What can we do for you, Judy? Uh -huh. You have a question about cactus, Judy, on line five? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Two of them, for a matter of fact. One of them, I got a Christmas cactus, and it acts like it's dying, and I water it, but I don't know what else to do to it. A Christmas cactus. Mm -hmm. You water it, and then it's not doing very well? It might be old. I water them every Friday. Every Friday, that's <laughs> like a lot of people. So Christmas cactus, that's a plant that a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. So what are, what are some good tips on Christmas cactus that we can help her out with? Well, don't water too much. She may be overwatering. Um, that's a common mistake a lot of people make with household plants um, because they droop when they're overwatered. So you think that they need water and you give them more water and uh, it just makes the situation worse. So I would not water it on a regular schedule. Um, I would just, what I do with my house plants is I stick my finger in the dirt and, uh, or in the hole on the bottom and feel how wet it is rather than relying on because the surface can be dry but down deep it's it can be really wet so probably the biggest thing is just really check and make sure mm -hmm. that probably with that particular plant with christmas cactus really good for they dry out in between Clean, watering right. so oh, you okay. maybe just overwater them a little bit so just kind of back off a little bit maybe you could do a friday and then a sunday <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> oh, okay. stretch them out they a little also bit i have another question Okay, you have a quick question I for us? I have a uh, Moses in the bulrush tree. Okay. And it was blooming, and now all the blooms are drying up. Some fell off, but not all of them. So I pick up, take all the rest of them off, and just leave it alone. Moses in the bulrush. Do you know that plant? No. That's a that's a old, it's a house plant from I yeah. I haven't heard that in a long time. But that's mm -hmm. a, actually a great uh, house uh, often yeah, use that a house kill. plant. <laughs> They're usually pretty hard to kill. Another one that might be overwatered. It certainly can mm -hmm. be overwatered. And uh, they have these little flowers on them that's supposed to look like Moses in the bulrush. Uh, and so you could go ahead and take those off as they. But I I wonder if that one's not being overwatered too. So you might just hold off on the watering a little bit. Okay. Hopefully that helps you. And on line six, we have uh, Joanne from Springfield, and sounds like there's a problem with your day lilies, Joanne. Have you, on line six, do you have a problem with your day lilies, Joanne? Or maybe Joan? Day lilies? Maybe not. Yeah. Oh. Uh huh. Hi. What can Hi. we do for you? Um, we have day lilies all over our yard, and I've always had real good luck with them. They're very easy to grow and everything. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a day. Two daylilies in different parts of the yard, and the leaves are beginning to turn brown and die over the last couple of weeks. Okay. So I don't know 
what's going on with them because all think? the ones mm-hmm. around them are fine. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I would just check the leaves, make sure there aren't any like spots on the leaves or anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, they do get a rust. Usually the tips. Yeah, they would usually be the tips will streaks. brown up yeah. a little bit if it's that. Um, dried out too much. Too could yeah, be dried that's out. I'm thinking yeah. that's somewhere along the lines. Yeah. 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 So sorry, we can't give you. That would be one of those things that might be great if you can take a picture or and send that to us, yeah. or you could actually uh, the plant clinic is always mm-hmm. a great uh, opportunity as well. The University of Illinois Plant Clinic. You can go on the website and find out more information about that. So that'd be great. Okay, very good. And on line four, we have a uh, Mary from Danville. Okay. Oh, it sounds like, oh, we're running out of time. I want to just keep going. <laughs> so we, I know we had a question about zucchini plants, but remember, you can always, uh, you can always go to our website. Uh, make sure you can connect with us that way. You can send us an email. You can check out the podcast and see if maybe we've already answered it one way along the line. But oh, man, it just goes so fast. Thank you all very much. And don't forget the podcast because it's a great opportunity uh, to get more information. Thank you all very much. I hope everybody gets a chance to get outside and garden. Remember Remember, it's good for you, it's good for your health, it's good for your family, it's good for the world. Mm-hmm.